Good morning. God's been good to us. He's blessed us to be able to come here this morning and to serve him in spirit and in truth. Good to see all those who are out visiting with us this morning. As Richard indicated, let me do first things. Let me do first things first. Happy Mother's Day to, uh, to all the ladies. And even if you don't physically have uh, any children, as Jimmy said, and I can appreciate this, you had a mom. And she sacrificed everything to make sure that you had the best that she could provide. And I don't care, I don't care, I don't care if it wasn't what you thought it should have been. See, let me let you in on a little secret and then I'm going to get in, into my lesson. See, when I left my house in Georgia and came to Texas, my mom became a lot smarter than I thought she was. And I was blessed a lot more than what I thought I was. So today I want you to do something for me. If your mother is still with us, I don't care if y'all don't get along, pick up the phone, reach out to her today, and just say, the preacher man said thank you for everything that you've done. You ain't got to mean it. Just use me as an example. You ain't got to mean it, but you should mean it because mothers, mothers are great people and they sacrifice everything for the sake of family. So happy Mother's Day to everyone, all the moms here. And if your mom has now gone from labor to reward, stop silently and just say a prayer. And just say thank you for my mom and for everything that she has done for me. Again, wanna to, want to thank and welcome those who are visiting with us. A couple of events and housekeeping keeping things we're gonna get out of the way. Uh, next week, um, we're going to uh, leave our services here after our services and we're going to attend a uh, graduate reception over at the Methodist Church. They have two graduates that will be um, walking the stage. The Trent School, high school, has only one this year. And as I understand it, they're having to talk that graduate even in the coming to graduation. So what we're doing as a support is we're preparing gift baskets for the one Trent graduate and the two that are graduating, I think, from Abilene, but they attend the Trent Methodist Church. Next week, we're going to go over and we're going to present the gift baskets on behalf of the churches in the Trent area, encouraging these young people to continue on their educational pursuits. Graduation is a time of celebration. And there's a lot of folk who wish they could have graduated, but had to go to work to support the family. Well, we ought to do all we can to encourage these young people. And so next year, I understand there'll either be eight or nine graduates that I'm aware of. And so we'll start uh, our hosting for the baccalaureate for next year. We'll start that earlier. This year, I knew there was only going to be one graduate. And I also knew that they were having to talk the graduate into even coming to graduation, much less uh, attending a baccalaureate. So we want to make sure that we do all that we can. I missed something that I need to make up. Those who are visiting with us, we are delighted to have you uh, visiting with us, whether you're in person or you're enjoying our live stream through social media. Those who are visiting with us in person, if this is your first time since I've been here, raise your hand. We got a gift for you. We want you to have a gift. First time since I've been here, because some, fo some folk got mad. Brother Emma, I've been here long before you. Well, you know what? We want to give you a gift anyway. Why? Because we love you. Because, because we love you. We want you to have that. If you're in the area again, please come back and, and visit with us here at the Trent Church of Christ. Also, I want us to get excited about our summer series that's going to be happening in the month of June. Uh, every Wednesday in June, we're going to have our summer series. What does that mean? Every Wednesday, we will have a different speaker that will come and speak to us based on the theme, basic training for Christian service. Now, Trent, this is our meeting. This is our gathering. We are hosting it. So I'm asking everybody who can plan your schedules now to be here every Wednesday night in June because we are going to have a time. I've sent invitations out uh, to all in the area. I've done Facebook posts and we are publicizing it, but it does no good for visitors to come and we don't show up to our own event. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm telling you, I know these preachers that are going to be coming in and they're going to do an outstanding job. The word is going to be preached. Well, it always is preached uh, in, in Trent, but especially in June, especially in June, the word is going to be preached. So every Wednesday night, please come out, plan your schedules um, to come out every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and let's participate in our Trent Summer Series. It's my hope, this will be our first one since I've been here, it's my hope to make this an annual event. There are certain things in the church calendar that just needs to be done on an annual basis and the Summer Series just needs to be one of those. Also, I didn't put a slide up here, but plan your schedules. In October, I'm working with Brother Freddie Anderson to get him back for our fall gospel meeting. Um, and so start planning that right now. He and I are having issues nailing down a specific date, but I do want that in October. And so just want you to be, be prepared for that. Again, first time visitors, want you to know that we are, you're welcome with us and we, we encourage you to come back and be with us at your next opportune time. For this month, I'm calling the series Five Words from the Cross. And you know, a lot of times, I don't think we talk about the cross enough. I think we talk about the cross during communion time and, and that's appropriate, but we don't talk about the blood that Christ shed on the behalf of my sins and on behalf of yours. And so this month I'm, I'm going through, and there are five words that Jesus uttered in each one of the translations of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's five words consistently that he uttered that I think we need to talk about when it comes to our proper understanding about the cross. Last week we talked about word number one, and that word was forgive. And you remember I said last week, um, that some of us going to have gate trouble because of a lack of forgiveness. We can hold a grudge longer than we can hold anything else. And I said it last week, and I'm not taking it back. Uh, if, if we don't get the idea of forgiveness right, we are not going to see God's face. Some of us going to have some serious problems. So I, I've, I've left that a little bit this week. Uh, that doesn't mean that I didn't mean it. I still meant it. But, but this week I'm going to the second word, and that is assurance. See, there's, sir, there's certain guarantees that come with being a Christian. When you've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and you've done what God wants you to do, no, that's not perfect, but you've gotten into the umbrella of being God's person and being a Christian. Now you have certain assurances that I'm not sure we understand that we have. Otherwise, some of us will be living a lot better than how we're living. Let's talk about the word assurance. Luke chapter 23. It's actually verse 34, and then I'm going to jump to verse 39 and finish it out in verse 43. Remember last week I said, Jesus said to them, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You remember Jesus was in the midst of hanging on that cruel cross. He was in the midst of, of being spit on and, and, and being hurt and, and being killed. And in the midst of that pain, the essence of forgiveness is all about recognizing forgiveness in the midst of my pain. I thought that was interesting. Jesus didn't wait until time was over and things got here. Jesus said, forgive them while they were in the midst of hurting and killing him. That's a lesson for us. But I left forgiveness, and we're going to go on to assurance. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there with him hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and, and, and said, don't you fear God? Since, since, since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly for getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, I can imagine in my mind, uh, they, they, if they could, they would kind of lean over or, or maybe see. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said in verse 43, and I think this is a most misunderstood verse. But, but he said in verse number 43, 
Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. Thank you for just the blessing that we have of you sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. We are so thankful and so in awe of that blessing and that gift. We, we can't pay you back. We'd never be able to, to pay you back. But just let our life be a living sacrifice so that you will find our deeds pleasing and acceptable to you. We pray for the message, Father. We pray that it will be said in a way that you want it said, that the messenger will hide behind the cross so that others may see Christ crucified and dwelled. We thank you for this and all your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I'm going to start this this morning and I'll finish it online tonight. So please make sure that if I don't have your email address and you want to participate with those uh, lessons on Sunday evening, please make sure that I have that because I'm going to start it today and I'm going to finish it tonight. Verse 43 is the most misunderstood verse, I think, in all of the New Testament. So let me just tell you for 35 seconds what we're not going to do. I'm not going to go talk about the thief on the cross and whether or not he was saved because I think to go down that rabbit hole, you miss the essence of what this text is really teaching. But let me just say it. Let me say it like this. Jesus hadn't died yet. And under the old law and under the old dispensation, there was still a whole lot of different rules that we don't enjoy, that we didn't have because Christ hadn't died yet. But let me just say it. Let me say it like this. The target for this text and this one verse isn't salvation. It's assurance. At least this guy had enough gumption, enough sense while he was hanging on the cross to acknowledge the fact, listen, I'm wrong and I need help. And the best way to go to help and get help is to go to the man, Jesus Christ, who's hanging right there with me. So the, the meat to this text, don't, don't do this text an injustice by trying to figure out if the thief on the cross was saying, don't do that. The best way to handle this text is to handle this text with the word assurance. It's the same word, and it's the same concept when Peter was walking on the water. And remember, after he flipped off and, and said, Jesus, if it's really you, let me walk and come to you. Jesus said, come on. It's the same concept that Jesus, that, that Peter saw when he was walking on the water. As long as he kept his eyes on Christ, he was all right. But remember, Luke said, when he saw the winds, boisterous, and when he, when he saw everything working against him, you remember what happened? He began to sink. And he cried out the same way this guy, guy cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. So the word here is not necessarily salvation. What you're walking away from this text is assurance. You can be sure that if you ask God for help, God will help you. Now, that's the text, and that's what we need to talk about. That's why I'm calling this one Blessed Assurance. We need to make sure that we understand that when Jesus hung, bled, and died on the cross, he gave us a connection. And we can be assured that in Christ, we have a blessing. So, from that word, I want to take you to a text. Like I said, I'm only going to begin it this morning. You want to catch the end? Like, my mother used to watch soap operas, okay? She, she used to watch soap And the only one I remember, and it's probably long since gone now, she used to, I got to see my stories. I got to see what Erica doing. That, that's the only one. It's probably long since gone by then, okay? But mama never did miss. I think it was Erica King. Okay, mama didn't, mama didn't miss Erica. Well, you know what? If you want to catch the end of this lesson, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to do like Mama used to do with Erica. you got to tune in <laughs> at the next episode. And you're going to have to come see, come see the rest, come see the rest of this. The key word, the key word is assurance. We have an assurance in Christ. Listen to how John put it. First John chapter 3, and I'll give you, I'll give you two of the takeaways. I'll give you the next one, the last one tonight. John says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth. And, and this is how we know that we set our hearts to rest 
in his presence. John says, if our hearts condemn us, then we know that God is greater than our hearts and we know that God knows everything. Now, don't let that language fool you. In simple English, God knows you better than you know yourself. Amen. In simple English, God knows what you were even thinking about doing before you did it. Amen. And he loved you so much, he let you do it anyway. And I can, I can only imagine God, God, like my own father, look at him and say, Lord, help him. <laughs> Lord, 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 just say, I told you stories, and, and I did the exact opposite of what my father told me to do. And my, my father had a tremendous sense of humor, a, a lot like his son. Um, and, and, and God, God just, I can only say, God, imagine, Lord, help him. Just, just Lord help him. If you understand assurance, then you understand God is greater than our hearts. And God loves you, and God loves me so much. He knew what you were thinking about doing before you did it. He allowed you to do it anyway and loved you through it. Verse 21, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and we receive from him anything that we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. What does that mean, your heart doesn't condemn you? Your conscience. If you're doing something, and after you've done it or in the process of doing it, your conscience is hurting you, your conscience is telling you don't do it, God is greater than your heart. Yeah. God is greater than your conscience. I used to tell my kids all the time when they got, when they got old enough, and before I took them to college and, 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 and dropped them off, I said, now, you're going to learn some things being out on your own that I didn't teach you. Do me a favor. When you, when you come to that fork in the road, have a little mercy on the old man because I didn't know so much of everything. And maybe you could come back and kind of teach us and we can learn together. We can be assured that our relationship in God through Christ is connected with confidence of knowing that we are connected to a God that knows us mm -hmm. better than we know ourselves. It's important to know that when you read through John, especially 1 John, when you read through 1 John, three things are happening. And, and picture in your mind like a triangle. See, John's talking about here authentic Christianity. And authentic Christianity has three legs to this, this triangle. And John, John, John makes this case all the way through the book of John. Number one, there's a moral test of obedience. Number two, there's this relational test of love. How, how, do, how well do we obey God and how do we treat one another? And then there's a doctrinal test of faith. We're talking about that now, by the way, in Bible class. I'm so thankful. Jimmy, for your prayer in Bible class. I want to invite those who aren't uh, perhaps coming to Bible class with us, come make the investment. Come make the sacrifice. We are having a time in, in that Bible class learning the word, encouraging each other, and studying God's word. The main idea in John, 1 John especially, is that when our hearts condemn us, we must rest on the basis of assurance. When our hearts are confident, we will enjoy the blessing of assurance. I'm going to deal with that tonight. When your heart is confident, when your conscience is clear, and you know I haven't done anything but obey you, God, then that's when you need the blessings of assurance. This morning, let me give you two scriptures that really talk about how we should listen to our heart. We should actually listen to our conscience. We should obey God in our conscience before we even get into trouble. Let me give you one thing. I'm going to give you two, the first one. Assurance is based on the knowledge of God's work in our lives. See, in spite of how I've treated God in my life, he still loved me. Mm -hmm. In spite of, 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 of the wrong that I said I wasn't going to do and I promised God uh, if you get me out of this, I'll never do this again. In spite of the fact that I lied to God, God still loved me. And God still takes care of me. And that, that assurance, that knowledge of assurance, we need to rest on because one of these days, we're going to have to give an account for the deeds that are done in our body. See, when, when you are troubled by doubt and self-condemnation, don't focus on your failures. Focus on the love of God. See, if I was to ask a question right now, name the last five failures in your life. 
you could probably rattle them off lickety split. But if I was to raise the question and say, tell me the last five good things God did in your life, some of us would be struggling. Why? Because we don't focus on the positive in our life. We more than likely focus on the negative. Don't focus on your failures. Focus your faith on God and make sure that as we have this assurance and this confidence in God, make sure that we are obeying him. Paul said it like this in, in, in 2 Timothy. And of this gospel, I was appointed as a herald and an apostle and a teacher. And listen to how confident he is. Listen to this assurance. That's why I'm suffering, Paul said, as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know in whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day or until that day. God loves you and me so much that in spite of the wrong and the stuff that I do, I still know that God has my back. Amen. And I need to serve him and do all I can to say, Lord, I love you. And I know I disappoint you, but I'm asking for your forgiveness and I'm resting on the assurance that I have in Christ. Let me give you the Amen. second one and I'm done on, for God. now. For now, I'm done. Our assurance in God needs to be based on, the greater, on God's greater knowledge of us. Let me say it one more time. Our assurance when it comes to our relationship in God needs to be based on the fact of how well God knows us. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And even though we get to the point to where we do what we want to do and we ignore God, and then we come back like a kid with, with broken pieces and say, God, fix it, and we get mad at God when he does it, that's wrong. Because God gives us the capacity to love him and to obey him. But in spite of all that, y'all know what? God is still greater because of our, his knowledge of us. Paul said it like this in Romans 8, and then I'll conclude and I'll, I'll do the rest of it online tonight. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. He said, we are more than conquerors. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? He who, who spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I like verse 33, and you should too. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? See, the, the assurance needs to be, if I have obeyed the gospel and I am in Christ, no matter how much I mess up, God still loves me. Now, let me pause for 10 seconds here. Now, that's not a license to go out and do what you want to do anyway. <laughs> now, I got to come to the other side of this for just a minute. See, a lot of us, a lot of us take God's grace and God's love for granted. And, and we think that we can do what we want to do and then get to where we take our last breath. Okay, Lord, help me. No, it don't work like that. It doesn't work like that. But God's love will never leave us in spite of the fact in spite of the fact that God still cares for us. Verse 33, who's going to bring in charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? No one. Christ, uh, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised uh, to life, is at the right hand of God. And watch this. He still makes intercession or is interceding on our behalf. So what's the message to, to the text? We need to be assured that God's love for us still remains intact and it stands strong but it's our responsibility to live obedient lives to the best of our ability to make sure that God's love for us doesn't last or land in vain. Join me tonight online, 6 o'clock and I'm going to finish this I want to talk about um, the assurance of a confident heart. In other words, I know that God loves me. I know that I am somebody when it comes to my relationship with God, but sometimes life gets in the way. 
And sometimes choices and decisions are made in such a way that I feel so bad. How can God love me after what I've done? Tonight I'm going to talk about that because there is some confidence that we, you and I, need to understand. And there's some things that you and I need to understand that nothing is going to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. If you have a prayer need in your life, something that you're facing in your life that you just can't handle, and you've been trying to handle it on your own and it has not been working out, then it's time for you to get out of God's way, surrender that thing to God, and let God take care in 20 minutes of what you've been trying to do for 20 years. Amen. See, one of the things we need to understand is our God is awesome, our God is powerful, our God is loving, but our God is also serious. He said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. He says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If we've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have an advocate with the Father, the man Jesus Christ, that we can come to God in prayer. But you know what? If we continue to live the way that we want to live and shake a fist of rebellion in God's face after receiving chance after chance and knowing the word and we still don't obey the word, then at the final analysis, we're going to stand guilty and a guilty distance away from God and nobody wants that. So you, you, you make it easy every time you come to worship. You confess your faults one to another or if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you come by hearing his word, by believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, and being willing to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins, based on that act of obedience, God then adds you to his congregational family. The invitation time is a time to come, and it's really a time of surrender. Lord, I've been trying to do this on my own, and it's messed up every single time. I'm tired of fighting. I'm giving this over to you. I need your help. I need your strength. I need your glory. I need your encouragement. If you have a need that you want to express to God through the church, we invite you now to come as we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>